good day and welcome to Tata Motors UNFY 25 Meets Call. Today with us are Mr. P. B. Balaji, Group C F O Tata Motors. Mr. Girish Wag, Executive Director Tata Motors. Mr. Sailesh Chandra, M D Tata Motors Passenger Vehicles Limited and Tata Passenger Electric Mobility Limited. Mr. G. V. Ramanand, Vice President Finance Tata Motors Limited. Mr. Diman Gupta, Vice President Finance T M P V L and T P M L. Mr. Adrian Madal, C O Jaguar Land Rover. Mr. Richard Molyneux, CFO Jaguar Land Rover, and we also have our colleagues from the Investor Relations team. Today, we plan to walk you through the results presentation followed by Q&A. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode, and we will be taking questions via the Teams platform. The same is already open for you to submit your questions. You are requested to mention your name and the name of the organization while submitting the questions. I now hand over to Balaji sir to take over. Over to you, sir. Thank, thank you, Anish. Uh, welcome to the call. Uh, standard safe harbor statement. We'll quickly run through the deck and then take spend as much time as possible on the questions. It's been an intense action packed quarter. Uh, uh, the most exciting one coming up is the Tata curve that is set to be launched August 7th is the date. What's the space? And uh, of course, last week, the most exciting thing in JLR was the Jaguar TCS racing winning the world e, e racing championship. So uh, an exciting uh, journey out there and of course the defender Octa coming up uh, pretty soon. So lots of action underway and uh, continue to intend to keep this action at this level of intensity. Next slide please. Um, from a revenue perspective, the quarter was a was a decent quarter with a revenue of 5.7 percent growth, uh, though the volumes grew only two and a half percent mix obviously coming to play. PVT before exceptional items showed a very strong increase to 8,800 crores driven by favorable commodities both in JLR and, and in Tata Motors here. EBITDA was flat at 14.4 and obviously the volume growth feeding into the EBIT numbers at 30 odd BIPs operating leverage and very satisfying to see a positive cash flow in the first quarter which is seasonally our weakest quarter and therefore that's come through well. Bye. Sources of growth where it came from, most of it coming from volume and mix, a little bit drop on pricing, translation with the pound sterling going up uh, at 1.6%. And uh, all most of the businesses came to the party in terms of improving their profitability on the EBIT line. Net debt marginally up, basically because of the dividends that went out from Tata Motors. Uh, and uh, that should again, and of course the seasonally for Tata Motors, Q1 is always a negative cash flow, which I'll show you subsequently as well. That's what's the net debt going up there, but uh, no stress, it will come back under control and JL are on track to go net debt free as well. Next slide. Uh, spending a little bit of time on the corporate action before I hand it over to the businesses to take them through the numbers. Uh, one is the demerger. Uh, maybe take a minute to explain the transaction. The way the demerger will happen is in two steps. Step one, we are demerging the CV business undertaking out of the existing Tata Motors company into the new CV list code. Immediately after that, the passenger vehicle business, which is a subsidiary of the uh, existing list code called TML, will be merged into the TML existing company. That is important to get done because it does. We don't want the top code to be construed as a CIC, and hence this becomes a proper operating company. These will be the two listed companies. And obviously, along with the CV business and the undertaking, all its investments will also move. And whatever is left behind will all be submerged into the TMPV company. This is what is happening. Along with that, the CV company, the newly formed CV company will be renamed as TML. And the existing TML company will be renamed as startup and motor passenger vehicles. All of this is expected to happen in the next 12 to 15 months. And the appointed date for this transaction, we are targeting 1st July 2025. And when the demerger happens, whoever is on the record date, the shareholder of Tata Motors will be eligible for one share each of the CV company, that is TML, and one share in the existing uh, TML, which will be called TMPV. These are the this is the nature of the transaction. One of the most important number in this, the entitlement ratio is obviously one is to one. One of the most important number is the asset ratio as on the appointed date, 
we expect it to be broadly 60 50. That is 60 percent as CV, 40 percent as the residual PV that will be there. That is how the TML standalone will, will cut out. And this will be tax neutral for the CV and PV undertakings as well as the shareholders. And the next 12 to 15 months it is there. The share entitlement report has been filed by PwC and the fairness opinion for the same given by SBA Capital Markets. Next slide. This is just the listing. I don't want to go through this. Uh, I will leave it to you. Reach out to us if there's anything that you would like us to clarify upon. Otherwise, it is uh, just the listing out of all the companies where it is going to go and more than happy to clarify anything offline that you may require. Next slide, please. Second set of corporate actions is the merger of Tata Motors Finance, the NBFC with Tata Capital. Uh, the boards, are, as I, we announced in June, have already approved it. Uh, the scheme has is, uh, is already been filed. It's with the stock exchanges and we expect to get this transaction completed in the next nine to 12 months. And we are in advanced discussions with RBA for securing their approvals as well as the stock exchanges. And the last one which is the cancellation of DVRs and the issuance of ordinary shares. The NCLT hearing has been completed and the NCLT order is reserved for final judgment. We have a hearing tomorrow where we expect to receive the orders. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, and upon final judgment and of course all other steps will start off and we are hoping to complete this in the next two months uh, so that the DVRs get cancelled and we have ordinary shares issued in the return. So all the corporate actions are running at full speed and we intend to get all of them closed before the demerger. Next slide please. With this let me hand it over to Richard to take you through the JLR performance. Richard over to you. Okay, thank you Balaji um, and if we could move to the next chart. So look, bottom line for us is we continue to deliver strong and consistent financial results. This is based off uh, wholesale number in the quarter. It was 97.8K, that's up 4.8% over the prior year. Uh, we produced 100,000 vehicles and we retailed 111,000, including our uh, joint venture in China. That 4.8% increase in wholesales turned into a 5.4% increase in revenue to 7.27 billion pounds. That is a record quarter one revenue level for JLR. It also turned into a really strong PBT number of 693 million, which I'll explain later. EBIT, 8.9%. This is the sixth quarter in a row that we have had EBIT of over 6%. That's the consistency of our delivery. Uh, and also at this 8.9% level, it is consistent with our full year guidance of greater than 8.5% EBIT. In terms of cash flow, 230 million pounds favorable. This is our seventh consecutive quarter of free cash flow. Uh, that is something that JLR has never done in its history before. It's also the second highest ever Q1 cash flow uh, behind the 451 million that we recorded last year. We've added ROSI to our metrics on a 12 month rolling basis at 21.2%. Uh, that is consistent with our full year target of 22%. So next chart, please. Um, and I won't go through this. This will get covered uh, in entirety as I go through the rest of the pack. So next chart, please. Next chart, please. Just, just a minute. It's, it's, it's changing. It's taking a little bit of time. Hold on. Look at the talk in the meantime. There we go. Um, so this looks at our wholesales and retail performance by brand. Range Rover, a strong success. Wholesales were up 25% year over year and retails up 20% year over year, driven largely by the removal of production constraints as we finish the ramp up at our Solihull plant. Defender, a little bit weaker in terms of wholesales, but that is just the timing effect. If you look at the retail uh, line for Defender, it is fairly flat and clearly flat at a very healthy level, significantly over 100,000 units per year for us. Discovery, retail's also fairly consistent. And Jaguar, as expected, uh, wholesales are down. We ceased production of XE, XF and F-type during the quarter. Um, that obviously translates into lower wholesales. 
the retail number is fairly flat as we then start to uh, sell through uh, the stock levels. So uh, no surprise in terms of where we are in terms of jacking. Next chart. So this is the same thing, but by region. The UK up 36% year over year. It is down versus Q4, but that's a very natural seasonality in the UK driven by uh, registration plate changes. US up 38% year over year. That's really strong brand performance, and the US is now nearly a third of our quarterly wholesale volume. Europe is a bit tougher, uh, and there are high competitor discounts in that market at the moment. However, if you look at the retail performance, it's in fact slightly improved over the same quarter last year. China, flat year over year. Um, certainly in terms of the imported cars. It is a market we're paying close attention to. And overseas, again on a retail level, is fairly flat, uh, a modest decline year over year, um, but that is from an, a truly exceptional year in FY24. So next chart. So it shows the walk of PBT from the same quarter last year, so a walk from 435 million to 693. Volume and mix favourable, volume we've spoken about. Mix is the increased production and hence um, uh, wholesales of Range Rover, Range Rover Sport as we ramp through the launch curve um, and to full capacity at our Solihull plant. We do see increased sales allowances on a uh, retail incurred level, they were at 3.2% in the quarter, and that is up versus the previous quarter, which was at 2.4% and the previous year. Um, the biggest increase has been in the UK, to counter amongst other things, the higher insurance rates following targeted thefts by organized crime gangs. Material cost compensated the vast majority of the incremental VME. So if you look at net pricing and contribution costs together, they are fairly flat. That is the result of true cost reduction and also reduced supplier claims as the global inflation uh, environment becomes um, uh, less penal. Structural costs, up slightly. Half of that is in relation to FMI and selling costs to drive demand the other half in relation to systems development and deployment. I guess the big variance is FX and commodities. Uh, sterling did strengthen during the quarter, hence the operational FX adverse. Um, that was more than offset by our hedging portfolio. The big point here is the unrealized commodity um, derivatives. So both aluminium and copper rose by about 10% uh, during the quarter. Uh, and we have a significant hedge portfolio. So that hedge portfolio gains 58 million pounds in the quarter, and that compared to a 79 million pound loss in the previous uh, year's quarter, Q1 the previous year. Hence the delta quarter by quarter of 137 million pounds. Next chart. Okay, so in terms of how that 693 million turns into free cash flow, if you look at cash profit after tax, 1.298 billion. That is up 14% versus Q1 FY24. We are spending more on executing our plans, 951 million on investment. Um, and we did get a small working capital hit in the quarter. That hit is actually a little bit lower than we were expecting, um, as we did manage to turn uh, most of the month end uh, receivables into cash. Uh, so the receivables change was uh, was less penal than we had hoped, uh, than we had feared, um, and that led to uh, 230 million pounds worth of free cash flow in the quarter. Next chart. So investment, I mentioned 951 million. Of that, 678 million is engineering, uh, with a capitalisation rate of 66%. That capitalisation rate is up slightly versus the average in FY24 as uh, the vast majority of the programs that we are now engineering uh, are approaching their, uh, their launch timing. I expect engineering to stay close to peaking at these levels and then to slowly come down from. Next chart. 
Right, business update. So I've got two main updates for you. The first is an important announcement for our China JV, which will license the Freelander brand from JLR and blend together with Cherry's EV engineering to create new products for the China market initially, but that do have the potential for global retail. This is a real win-win. It's the best of what we do in terms of brands with the best of what Cherry do. It's complementary to both companies, so it's independent from Cherry's existing portfolio and it's independent of our house of brands. Um, this, this arrangement is highly accretive. I actually think the markets have uh, underestimated uh, the significance of this announcement. Next, and equally, if not more exciting, um, can provide a little bit more clarity on the rebirth of Jaguar. This, this is a once in a generation opportunity. Um, we get to reset, redefine and relaunch a truly iconic British brand for a new audience, for a new set of customers. We have done the first phase and we are now starting the launch of the brand. Um, that will happen towards the back end of this year, most likely in the US and we will launch it as a brand first with the vehicles to follow. New Jaguar will be a copy of nothing. It will be exuberant, modernist, unique, fearless and very progressive. And we're, we're actually seriously looking forward to revealing New Jag to the world. <clears throat> Next page. So looking ahead, We've had a successful Q1, a very successful Q1, but FY25 is not without its challenges. Most front of mind is that one of our key aluminium suppliers has been impacted badly by a flood, and this will disrupt our inbound supply. It's not impacting us currently, but we do expect it to constrain our production through the balance of Q2 and into Q3. We're working very hard to find solutions, but it will have a short-term impact. We will hold our guidance on our key full year financial deliverables of greater or equal to 8.5% EBIT and achieving net cash. And we'll update you further at the end of Q2. Guidance beyond FY25 is uh, unchanged. So, summary. We remain committed to sustainable cash generative growth. We're delivering our promises. We're unlocking opportunities for growth, be that Okta or be that Freelander. We're growing and doing so responsibly. Focusing on ROSI and capital allocation, for example, between BEVs and ICE. And we are convinced the best is still to come. With that, I will hand back to Balaji. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, let me now hand it over to Girish and Ramnan. Ramnan just introduced. He's the CFO of the commercial vehicle business. Let me give it to Girish and Ramnan. Ramnan, over to you as we start off. Thank you, Balaji. Just to kind of take you quickly through the market share for commercial vehicles, I think the headline is overall market share is in line with the range that we had last year. So we had around 39%. And it's been growing in all the signals, except that on the light uh, goods vehicle that we have, we've had a drop of around 120 lifts. A quick financial snapshot uh, for Q1. Overall, um, all sales has been a year on year growth of around close to 6%. The revenue at 17.8 is, is a 5% growth over um, last year's same time. And PBT, healthy PBT in Q1 of around uh, 1.5k crores. EBITDA at 11.6 is a 220 bips growth over last year. And an EBIT of 8.9 is 240% growth, 240 bips growth over last year. All this cumulatively leading to a good improved financial performance reflecting in the ROC going close to 40%. Go to the next page. In terms of our EBIT walk, uh, versus Q1 last year to now. I think key factors which have really influenced um, a good volume mix, 
favorable volume coming in from HCV is kind of impacting to the extent of around 100 bips. And then uh, realization and variable cost largely driven by commodities gain uh, is helping us to the extent of around 270 bips. So those have largely kind of helped towards improved profitability versus last year. For business update, I would hand this over to Girish now. Thank you, Ramanan, and good evening, everyone. So let me start with the highlights for the quarter gone by. So the wholesale volumes uh, for Tata Motors uh, and within that for M and HCV grew 7% YOY. And uh, for CV passenger carriers uh, also grew and we performed better than the industry. We had the uh, highest ever revenue in a Q1 at around 17,849 crores. And also as Ramnan mentioned, highest ever EBITDA and EBIT. Uh, on the market share front, heavy commercial vehicles, intermediate light medium commercial vehicles and the CV passenger segments, I think all these we grew month on month in Q1, surpassing the FY24 exit market share also. I think overall CV share was marginally impacted, essentially due to the small commercial vehicle and pickup segment, which continues to face headwinds in terms of financing for the first time users, especially for the mini truck segment. The non vehicle business revenue grew by 8% year on year basis. So some of the bright spots, I think contrary to expectations, uh, the demand really mm -hmm. remained uh, robust with industry volumes growing. And within that, I think for Tata Motors, the MNSCV volumes grew by 10%. Uh, whereas the passenger carrier, including buses, grew by 39%. Uh, but within that, let me tell you that Bulk of the growth in MNSV was actually led by the medium commercial vehicle segment, the 19 ton segment. Uh, the fleet utilizations remained at healthy levels in Q1, post Q4, generally Q1 utilizations may be a bit uh, down after Q4, but remained at a healthy level. We have seen a healthy monsoon and expecting the policy continuity now with uh, a lot of capex allocation for infrastructure projects, we expect that the CV demand should gradually keep up, keep up pace with all these micro factors. We have seen uh, enhanced contribution of uh, digital lead generation to our retail, almost at 28% now. We continue to launch new products and variants, so 25 plus product and 70 variants were launched in quarter one. We continued our cost optimization efforts and also realization improvement from the market in, in Q1. Now going ahead, our focus areas for trucks and buses. Yes, we will continue to introduce new variants for uh, the white spaces and we'll have aggressive market activation as well as promotion of the value added services to drive the volumes. On small commercial vehicle, as I've spoken in the past, we are doing this entire front end transformation from a B2B organization to B2B to C. So we will continue this deployment. Uh, we will continue growth in downstream by increasing our penetration of service and spare parts. In international markets, uh, we continue to maintain the market shares in the markets where we play while improving our margins as well as channel health. Uh, cost reduction efforts, as I said, was uh, was a was a bright spot in the quarters on by, and in fact, the commodities also remained flat in Q1 and likely to remain at an overall level flat in Q2 as well. Uh, we are accelerating our uh, sustainability initiatives, whether it is about net zero greenhouse gas emissions or circularity. Going next on the electric mobility. So we deployed more than 160 buses in Q1. So now we have more than 2,900 buses deployed till date. On ASEV, 
you know, after the discontinuation of uh, FAME 3, we introduced the new product ACE EV one ton payload and have been able to sell more than 800 units in first quarter, which actually delivers better operating economics uh, to the customer. So I think this has helped us to stem the reduction in volumes in the post frame environment. We now have more than 5,400 vehicles flying and cumulatively clocked 26 million kilometers. We have received the PLI certificate for the one ton variant of ACE EV also. On the smart city mobility solutions, so cumulative 2,900 plus buses have crossed now more than 160 million kilometers and we continue to improve the operational efficiency having 95% uptime for the buses. We continue to deployment under the CSL tender that we won. Within Delhi and Bangalore, more than 300, 1300 buses are deployed. And in Jammu and Srinagar, we have deployed almost 200 buses. For the new tender, we continue the discussion with the government authorities for payment security mechanism, which has been accepted but awaiting cabinet approval. We are working with the government authorities to find out ways and means to come up with an asset like business model. And once this is done, I think we will be participating in the upcoming tender. On the digital businesses, Fleetage now has more than 690,000 uh, vehicles on the platform. And the machine learning enabled a fuel efficiency mileage SARTI model that we have introduced. We have now cumulatively more than 40,000 vehicles signed up and 18,000 vehicles signed up in previous quarter and the vehicles ex are experiencing anywhere between 5 to 6 percent real life fuel efficiency improvement. On the fleet edge, we continue to see improved engagement time as we keep on adding enhanced informative and contextual insights, whether it is on operations, the vehicle health, as well as driving behavior. Ebukan, our online marketplace for selling spare parts, continues to do well, and we had the 2.6 times growth in the revenue over Q1 of FY24. And Fleetverse, which is our online platform for selling vehicles, we had 9,800 platform assisted retails, and this continues to grow month over month. Back to you, Balaji. Thanks, Girish. Uh, let me now invite Shailesh and also introduce Diman Gupta, the CFO of the passenger vehicle business and EV business. Uh, uh, Shailesh, Diman, over to you. Diman. Thank you, Balaji. Uh, moving on to the PV side uh, of the business, uh, it has been quite comforting to see the consistency in our Wahan market shares, hovering close to 14% over a sustained period now. Uh, this has been achieved despite no new negative additions in our portfolio for some time. This augurs well for our new forever strategy, which has helped in keeping our existing portfolio always fresh and desirable. With the launch of Curve, India's first SUV coupe this month, we expect further market share wins from here. Our multi powertrain strategy continues to come through nicely, with mix of CNG and EV now covering nearly one third of our portfolio. The build towards an emission friendly portfolio ensures our cafe headroom is substantial at this point of time. And we are also future ready for the next wave of uh, cafe introductions that happen. Next slide, please. On the EV side, while the personal segment has remained steady, we have seen a sharp year on year decline in the fleet demand post the expiry of the fame 2 in March 24, a quarter in which we saw a substantial amount of free buys. This is reflected in our lower offtakes and market share for the quarter. Our journey towards increasing EV penetration, expanding product portfolio at various points price point continues. Curve EV, our first EV nameplate, our first uh, EV first nameplate is expected to further bring in new set of customers who are looking for a bigger EV and a higher driving range. Do watch out for the launch event we have planned on 7th August and for all the exciting new benefits that this new nameplate will unlock. Another big piece of the work underway to support the growth of our portfolio is the intensity at which we continue to work with charge point operators expand the charging infrastructure in the country. Uh, the pace uh, we continue to intensify 
and we saw addition of another 2000 odd charges this quarter. Cherish is going to cover the market scenario in greater detail in the coming slides, uh, but the financials are reflective of the subdued market demand that we've seen this quarter, where industry details have degrown for two consecutive months in May and June due to a combination of peak summer in various parts of the country, of the country and the elections. Uh, this led to a step up in VMEs by OEMs uh, due to the higher levels of channel stock. For TML, you know, as is, as we have seen in the past couple of quarters, the focus continues to remain on maintaining Wahan market share and correcting our wholesales for having optimal level of channel inventory. While our wholesales were down 1%, the revenues are down 7% due to lower EV sales and a weaker mix uh, in general on the ice side. We've maintained our pretext profitability on a year-on-year -year basis. The EBITDA margin uplift that you see on a year-on-year -year basis is largely a function of the ICE EV mix, and I'll just peel it out further in the next slide. Next slide, please. The segment financial split of EV and uh, EV ICE and EV profitability. On the ICE part of the business, we've been able to maintain our EBITDA margin on a year-on-year -year basis at about eight and a half percent and substantially improved our EV free EBITDA margins by 6% on a year-on-year -year basis. This has been achieved on the back of the structural material cost reductions that we continue to make, further aided by the tailwinds that we've seen in the battery prices. This has helped offset the adverse impact of VME and NIX and the loss in operating leverage due to the lower than anticipated volumes that we've seen this quarter. On the ICE side, we expect to see sequential improvement in margins in the coming quarters on the back of improved festive demand and the launch of curve. Cherish, over to you. Thank you, Dimal. So let me take you through the quick update. First, starting with the industry. Um, you know, after witnessing 15% growth year on year in April, primarily because of festivities, uh, the industry did face stress. Uh, from a registration perspective, we saw a sequential fall in retail from 1% to 7% in May and June, respectively. Um, uh, however, the industry registered wholesale growth year on year uh, of 4% in May and June. That has resulted in increased channel inventories. Uh, and we have seen that high channel stock led to discounting actions towards the end of quarter one. Uh, coming to Tata Motors, uh, our, uh, as uh, was also mentioned by uh, Demon, that uh, wholesale growth in quarter one was flat with steep correction that we took in June to keep the channel inventory under check. Uh, we maintained our Wahan market share at 13.7% uh, driven by you know, sustained demand for fund CNG uh, vehicles, etc. Uh, financial performance was sustained despite industry headwind and you know, through multiple measures, including the offsetting measures like structural cost work, etc. Uh, talking about the bright spots in the industry, uh, it was actually interesting to see that uh, the inquiries uh, remained firm in May and June despite the declining retail. And that pretty much indicated that in the coming months, uh, the retail is going to come back. It was customers who are taking slightly more time in terms of converting to retail, and we did see uh, uh, some level of bounce back in July. Uh, and we expect that in the upcoming festive season, uh, the demand growth uh, is uh, going to come. For Tata Motors, uh, Punch has uh, sustained itself as number one model in the industry with 56,000 plus sales in quarter one. Um, we also took several marketing actions uh, that helped in generating strong bookings in June as well as in July this month, uh, last month. And uh, as Thiemann mentioned that we are going to enter the mid-size SUV segment for the first time with the launch of Curve, which will further help us grow our volumes. In terms of challenges for the industry, uh, we have an all-time high channel inventory with further buildup, uh, which happened in quarter one. Uh, did add stress on the whole sales. Uh, also, there has been moderation in the EV fleet segment uh, demand due to the expiry of fame to in March 24. Uh, as far as we are concerned, in terms of actions, we'll focus on retail acceleration backed by effective marketing campaigns, uh, micro market focus, targeted product interventions, which are going to come in the coming months. Uh, there are new upcoming launches, uh, primarily for to drive customer excitement, and of course, it is also going to help us improve footfalls in the showroom. Uh, we are also going to expand the customer fleet, you know, fleet customer base, uh, and also strengthen our offerings. 
and uh, the focus on uh, cost reduction uh, will be paramount. We will continue the rigor uh, on tight control on fixed cost and continued effort on uh, structural cost reduction within the organization. Uh, so back to you, Balaji. Thank you. Thanks, Shalish. Thanks, Dima. Uh, just quickly come, uh, covering the, the overall numbers. Next slide, please. On a free cash flow basis, this is a quarter, is seasonally a weak quarter for us. So we had an outflow of 1,300 crores, but heartening with the cash profit after tax, well, more than covering for the cap expense. So that discipline continues, and therefore, this 2,000 odd crores of cash outflow and working capital should reverse as the year progresses. So no stress here. Next slide, please. Investment spends, the details are there for you to see. Uh, we are clocking at the 8,000 crore rate that we had committed, and we'll be there in that zone. Next slide. Tata Motors Finance, as I said earlier, the, the effective date, I mean, uh, as far as the appointed date for this uh, merger is going to be April 1st, 2024. So this year's financials of Tata Motors Finance, the NBFC, will be merged with Tata Capital as and when the uh, NCLT approval is secured. That is just for information. But on an overall basis, the focus on growing the AUM while holding the portfolio quality continues. Disbursals are stepping up. We grew about 33% YOY basis. And uh, all the quality metrics and the pricing discipline, all of them are trending in the right way. It's seasonally a weak quarter from a collection perspective after a blockbuster Q4 that comes through. But despite that, we had solid collections coming through at 97 odd percent. And uh, this needs to be seen in the context of a general election as well. And so which will affect typically the cash flows of most customers. Uh, and of course, the concerted collection efforts are helping to contain GNP on an absolute basis and capital adequacy is under control. So this business is, is managing through this transition quite well. Next slide, please. Overall, from a from a uh, demand perspective, we do anticipate uh, as far as the global demand is concerned, it is likely to remain muted. It has been that way. It's likely to remain muted. Uh, no immediate uh, uh, changes there. Domestically, we expect a gradual improvement in the domestic demand during the rest of the year. As the investments in infrastructure, healthy monsoons, favorable macros, new launches, festive demand, all of that is coming through. So there is uh, there is a need for I mean uh, absolute reason why there's an optimism as far as the domestic demand buildup is concerned. How gradual is going to be? We'll have to wait and see. Commodities are also likely to remain range bound, and therefore in this situation, we are confident of sustaining the performance in the coming quarters and delivering a strong year. So financials wise, this business is on a strong wicket and is likely to remain that way uh, in the coming quarters and the full year as well. The respective priorities for each of the businesses is there for you to see. And uh, let me now turn it over for the questions which are piling up on the other side. Give me a minute, please. OK, uh, let's start with commercial vehicles. This is a, a question from Kapil uh, Namura. Uh, July data seems to be quite weak. Uh, this is on commercial vehicles to Girish. On MNHCB, July data seems to be a bit weak compared to first quarter. Any sudden changes you have noticed? And uh, should we expect improvement post the elections and heat wave? And how you see the full year? Right. So I think as I mentioned in the presentation, in Q1, we actually have seen a very good fleet utilization. And we are also able to track the kilometers run by the trucks uh, which are on fleetage, which also showed a good positive improvement over Q4. However, in the month of July, we have seen that the kilometer running has gone down for obvious reason, which is heavy rains. I think that impacted most of the infrastructure projects, mining operations. And it also impacted uh, to some extent goods transported on highways. Now, we've also seen due to this that the customers have postponed purchases from the month, and that has led to a drop in volume in July. If you see the pipeline, our pipeline, demand pipeline that we have now as compared to a year back, uh, that has not dropped to the extent that we have seen the drop in the wholesale volume in the month of July. Secondly, I think uh, what we've seen is in the infrastructure projects, 
quite a few of the customers have informed us about payments being omitted and they are expecting the payments to get released starting this month from the government. So that should also lead to action. Now beyond this, if you see at an overall level, I think good monsoons, while they have impacted the demand unfavorably in July, will actually mean good in the long term. The policy continuity as well as higher allocation to infrastructure projects, we expect that once this gets into execution mode, it should start helping the MNSCV demand again. Malay. Thanks, thanks, Girish. Uh, next question from Amin Pirani. Let me take that. This is a more an accounting question regarding the, where did the money go? Uh, if there is a 2,600 crores debt increase quarter on quarter, let me explain the numbers. Mm -hmm. As far as JLR is concerned, to the extent of the dividend that went out of JLR, that is neutral at a consolidated level. You're absolutely right. And therefore, there's only payout that went to the uh, vendor that we have okay. referred to in the notes to accounts. The India is a negative FCF to some extent. That is, I've explained that earlier. And the debt increase that you see at an overall level is basically the dividend that went out of Tata Motors to its shareholders. And that's why you see it also in the Tata Motors net debt as well. That's the only number. That's so. That's the only reason why the debt has gone up, which is temporary. And as the profits come through the quarters, you will see that correcting. Uh, question now. This is coming, Shailesh Yawe. Uh, what's the current dealer inventory in the India PV business? How does it compare with the industry as well as Tata Motors' own normalized historical numbers? Uh, our current dealer inventory would be in between 35 days to 40 days. Uh, we do track uh, or we do estimate the industry inventory levels, but since it's not a published data, I would not like to uh, really share that information. Uh, in terms of normalized inventory, typically we target about 30 days, uh, so it is on a higher side. Yeah, thanks, Shalit. Uh, Richard, this is coming in your way. Uh, this is from Janesh Gandhi Ambit. Uh, with 8.9% EBIT margins in a seasonally the weakest quarter for JLR, are we expecting any headwinds for margins for the remaining of FY25? And this is also connects to another question. I think it comes from Pramod in terms of the guidance for the year. Is there anything that you would like to reiterate? Uh, and then the question on the Freelander brand to JLR, how does it fit into the JLR's modern luxury house of brands approach? And maybe that could be for Adrian. And also, can you talk about the timelines and any investments from JLR or the royalty to be paid to JH Cherry for the EV architecture? And the last one is on the VME, which in JLR 3.2%. Till what level do you plan to invest? OK, so let me take the first one. Um, so 8.9 is consistent with our full year guidance, which was rated down or equal to 8.5%. Um, headwinds, I think I've mentioned the biggest headwind that we face is in relation to supply of, uh, of aluminium. Um, and uh, we will do our damnedest to make sure that that does not uh, stop us hitting our EBIT targets for the year. Can you also comment on the Freelander brand? Yeah, let, let me do that if, if, if Adrian's sure. not around. So um, it, it is it is outside of our house of brands. This is going to be um, a license agreement where the JV in China licenses the brand from JLR and combines it with technology from Cherry to produce vehicles under the Freelander brand for the Chinese market initially. Um, it is completely outside of uh, JLR's house of brands um, and uh, the distribution system um, when we announce it will reflect that. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that point, uh, remember that CJLR is a 50-50 joint venture between Cherry and uh, JLR and to that extent, whatever profit CJLR derives because of the yeah. sales of Freelander brand, 50% of the profit uh, is attributable to JLR. That's another answer there. Yeah, that's, that's, so, so JLR will receive from that a, a royalty and our share of the of the profits in that business. And if you think Freelander up until now has been a dormant brand um, and we turn it into a royalty flow, a 50% share of profits of a uh, Chinese based EV with a British brand, uh, you can see the potential that this has to be uh, accretive to our performance level. 
Thanks, Richard. The last one is on the VME, which is at 3.2 percent. Then what level do you plan to invest? So we think it will rise a little bit further, but only marginally from these levels um, as we uh, work through the effect of the reduced supply that we will receive in the next couple of quarters. Uh, that hopefully should cap um, the growth of the ME uh, at not that much higher than the Q1 level. Thanks, Richard. I'm, I'm going to stay with you for a while. Uh, this is on all things China. Uh, you explained the freelander transaction, park that aside for the time being, but the underlying performance, CJLR wholesale declined by Q1. This came from Aditya Java Investec. CJLR wholesale declined Q1. Even volumes for the car shipped from UK to China were flattish. Any sense on demand outlook in China, uh, as well as any market share indications you could give, as well as the EV penetration and luxury cars, cars in China. Anything that you see in that? So sure, the wholesale volumes in Q1 uh, for the domestic vehicles were 11,800. That's higher than Q4, although lower than the same quarter last year. So it, it's look, it, it's certainly more difficult and more difficult at the lower price points in China at the moment. However, the import business um, we still see as strong. Um, we don't measure or, or refer to market share, um, but we know that our sales are increasing year over year um, in China. So it reflects the strength of the brands, particularly Range Rover and Defender. We are paying close attention to it as there are certainly signals that demand uh, is not at the level that we would like to see it going forward. And it will be a focal point for us for the balance of the year to make sure that uh, we uh, we take the necessary action, so it is absolutely a focal point for us. Uh, EV penetrations right at our end. Uh, to be honest, it is very limited at the moment. Chinese customers for Range Rover and uh, Defender um, are still um, very much ICE customers. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question. Uh, sorry, Richard, I'm going to stay with you again. Uh, this is from Gunjun, uh, Bank of America. A couple of questions on JLR. How substantial can the impact of aluminum shortage in Q1, Q2 and Q3 be? And also, can you give some color on the CO2 emissions norms in EU in 2025 and how it affects us? Uh, and how do you want to mitigate the risk? I think you already covered. Yeah, so on the on the aluminum shortage, it is uh, it's relatively new news. And we are still working through how we can compensate. Um, we're normally fairly good at that. Um, our industrial operations team are, are very good at finding alternative sources, and we are also leveraging the Tata ecosystem uh, to help us in this. So we're not going to give specific numbers. What, what I will say is within our full year number set, we are aiming to compensate for it such that we can still hit our EBIT and uh, net cash position at the end of this year. Um, we will work through it over the next few weeks. We'll give you a better update uh, at the next quarterly meeting, uh, but we uh, we recognize it's a problem and we have all resource focused on short term mitigation and then medium term mitigation to make sure we can hold our full year uh, EBIT and net cash targets. Thank you. Uh, next question, probably I'll take it. This from Janesh Gandhi. Clarification of the asset ratio for demerger at 60-40 CVPV. This is just for the India business and not including JLR. Absolutely correct. It is just the standalone entity of TML that is getting demerged. CV is coming out of that. So for whatever is remaining is 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 the 40 percent that is there, which are basically investments that that company holds into the PV company, EV company, JLR. It is the investment value, which is all at book value. Uh, next question is from Chandramali again to JLR. Uh, uh, Richard, what's the quantum of price hike that was taken at the start of 25? And also, can you give us some pointers on from this 8.9% that is there? How should we think about the journey to the 15%? How do you build the building blocks? Uh, any uh, color on that? And maybe let me park here, then take the remaining questions once you finish this. Otherwise, I'll be just be asking questions. 
Okay, so look, um, pricing, we haven't taken a great deal of net pricing. So within the numbers that I showed you in terms of the, the variance pricing is not more than about 1% net. Um, how should we think about the journey to 15% EBIT margin? I'll refer that to the comments that I made during uh, the investor day where we cover that off in some detail. Um, driving the slight cut in FCF outlook for JLR in FY25. Um, what I've said is that we are going to hit net cash um, and we will work through the effects of the aluminium issue that I referenced in terms of uh, free cash and update you next time around. Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, I think next question I think is coming into CV. Uh, LCV segment growth potential after a period of flatness. How are you seeing that? So I think uh, like we mentioned at the beginning of quarter one, we see that uh, for the year, the LCV, uh, we call it a small commercial uh, vehicle segment, SCV pickup, should actually remain flat with respect to the last year. We'll see higher growth or double digit growth in the CV passenger, that is buses and van segment. And FCV, ILMCV is, is something we need to keep a watch on a quarterly basis. I think in the uh, uh, in ILMCV, we do see growth continuing, which happened in the first quarter also. FCV is something I think we need to keep a watch and how demand picks up this is some of the factors that i spoke in the question which i answered before this well, yeah thank you uh i think uh this i'll, I'll bring it into you uh, shailesh ev softness in the fleet segment can you just explain what's happening there yeah so you know there are many questions that i have been seeing you know around fleet yeah. segment so let me first give some facts. You know, fleet segment is typically an EV, 10% of the EV sales. That is how it had been in the 424, which uh, dropped to 5 to 6% uh, in uh, quarter one. Uh, the reason is that in quarter four, because fame two was uh, expiring, in quarter four, we saw two to three times jump in the fleet sales as a pre buy, and that actually led to quarter one declining significantly. Uh, to the extent of 45-50 percent um, <clears throat> and that has continued and overflown to July also because uh, there is also an expectation of fame 3 announcement uh, which uh, fleet owners would like to wait for. So uh, this is what's really happening uh, as far as fleet segment is concerned. Um, and uh, the other, any, this was the question. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Then question from Gunjan on electric buses. Can you give a better color on the volume breakup between personal and fleet? Almost this end business. Ah, so again, PV, so. Oh, sorry. My, 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 my bad. Go yeah. for it, Shailish. So I already just mentioned that it is 10 percent. Yeah, uh, is the fleet segment, uh, which currently has dropped to five to six percent. Uh, also, the question asks for fame policy continuity. It would not be right to speak about it, although we have been in continuous discussion with the government. We are hoping that the same fame two categories of vehicles which were given the fame benefit would continue. And it is uh, uh, very important that this segment is promoted because uh, the direction of Niti Aayog uh, when they framed the EV uh, the policy, uh, it was uh, focus on connected electric and shared mobility. So I think uh, government is very much focused on uh, uh, shared mobility. So we do expect that uh, we have to really wait and see uh, as and when it comes. I think Diman, this is probably coming to you. How are we treating PLI? How are you accounting for it? Are you accruing it? Can you just give us some color? Sure. Uh, you know, the auto PLI SOP, uh, you know, after a long wait has been finalized and issued by the MHI on 25th July. Uh, as of now, uh, on the passenger vehicle side, Tiago.ev is EAT certified and for which uh, techno commercial audit has also been completed. Uh, so all the sales in FI24 done for this vehicle for the select trips is eligible for uh, claiming PLI incentive. Uh, we are in the process of going through the SOP in detail because there have been certain changes from the last version that the OEMs had seen. Uh, and we are studying it for all necessary compliances and we are planning to file the 
claims by 30th September. Uh, we normally take a very conservative accounting policy when it comes to accruals towards any new incentive schemes of the government. Uh, and we typically take this only when the entire certification claims and the cash dispersal process is fully verified and established end to end. Uh, you know, all our EV products uh, that you've been introduced are TVA compliant uh, and the process for AT certification is in underway. So we plan to complete it uh, this quarter. OK, thanks, thanks uh, Devan. I think um, a bunch of questions, Shailesh, on the profitable, the ASPs of PV, profitability of PV. Uh, what we saw this quarter, there's been a drop even vis-a-vis -vis competition. How are you seeing it? You know, in the presentation, Dhiman already talked about it, that in quarter one, because of uh, EV volumes dropping, as well as, you know, in the ice side also, there was a, a model mix uh, which uh, uh, was under pressure. I think we are very confident of recovering back. We've already seen the recovery in July and henceforth, you know, in the coming months and with the new launches that we have, they should come back uh, very strongly. Yeah, and similarly on the CV side, uh, Girish, uh, despite yeah. price hikes and higher MNH CV contributions, CV ASPs declined on a YOY basis. Uh, could you give us some color? Yes, so is there any or other the specific point? Are we seeing any increase in discounting? Yeah, so actually, Jinesh, uh, from Q1 FI24 to FI25, the ASPs have gone up in CV, number one. Point number two, Actually, the heavy commercial vehicle salience has gone down. It was 30% in Q1 last year. This year it is 28%. And third, I think which probably you would not have noticed is within heavy commercial vehicles, there is a shift happening from multi axle vehicles to tractor trailers. And that also leads to a drop in average ASP. But despite that, Despite all this, we have seen an increase in ASP YOI basis. Thanks, Girish. Uh, next is from Dimon. I think uh, there's a few more people. Uh, sorry, next is from Binan. I apologize, uh, Morgan Stanley. Uh, question coming to you, Richard. And one more person has also asked down below. JLR depreciation dropped quarter on quarter. Could you explain, give us the reason? And secondly, your gross margins also came off quarter on quarter despite better mix. What drove that? And the rest of his questions have been answered. OK, so depreciation Q on Q. So we stopped production of the Jaguar XE, XF um, and uh, F type in CB during the quarter. Uh, so those assets are now uh, fully depreciated. So that is the, the main cause of the drop in depreciation. Um, gross margin, the, the only effect I'd call out is we, we did increase uh, VME during the quarter, as we've referenced, 3.2% on a retail basis. Um, we had to take a £60 million stock revaluation um, hit for that for vehicles that we had wholesaled but not yet retailed. So on top of what I've referenced before, those are the two items I would call out. Yeah, got that. Thank you. Uh, with respect to your, I think the next question is on the capex for the current quarter, and is there any risk to your overall guidance? We spent a billion dollars, almost billion pounds, almost this quarter. How does that speak to the three and a half billion that we had guided for the core year? Yes, so we are running a bit higher than target. That's partly because we have to continue development of both BEV, PHEV, and ICE powertrains. Um, given the global transition to BEVs is going, let me say slower and more globally patchy than many expected. We're also making sure we bring to market BEV solutions that are perfect for our brands um, with their off-road mastery, their luxury drive credentials. Uh, so we're learning from others that have gone before us, making sure our powertrains are perfect um, and uh, we will get close to 3.5 billion by the end of the year. As I said, I expect engineering to be peaking at the level we've shown in Q1 and start to reduce from there. Got it. Thank you. And uh, the HCF for the current quarter is weak. Uh, how do you plan to reach the full year plan? I think you've covered it in your cover. You just want to give it a little bit more color. Yes, yeah, so if you if you net out the um, working capital that, as you mentioned beforehand, will net out actually um, uh, sort of 
free, a free cash flow before working capital is at the 350 um, million level per quarter, um, and that's off uh, 98,000 units. So uh, it, it's not far off the type of run rate that we need. Got it. Thanks. Staying with you, I think you've talked about the timelines for discontinuing the Jaguar model. This is from Rishi Vora. Can you share the I mean, volume guidance FY25? Uh, most of the global OEMs have cut their guidance. Is there any demand pressures that the company is witnessing? Let me clarify, we, we did not give a volume guidance and we are moving into revenue as our, our main measure. Having said that, anything on the demand pressure, Richard, that you would like to talk about? Um, so I've mentioned look, there, is, there is demand pressure in some regions of the world. Other regions of the world are absolutely strong. Um, we're, we're probably at the point now with the supply constraints coming our way, but uh, certainly for the next few months, we're going to move into a supply constrained environment rather than demand constrained environment. Uh, and that will give us uh, more time through um, our FMI and marketing to build uh, build orders back up for the time that we can produce them. So it, it's, um, it, it, it's an environment where we, we, we do have some demand pressures, but I actually think in the next couple of quarters, the supply constraints are going to dominate. Got it. Uh, this is from Chirag White Pine on JLR. The LR mix is at 98, 91%, and in that Range Rover Plus Defender is at an all time high. Is this a new normal? If not, how will it affect impact ASPs? Um, well, at 91% certainly is a new normal until we launch the new Jaguars. Um, Range Rover and Defender at all, all time highs. Is that a new norm? I very much hope so, and I expect so. Um, so, our Sales during the quarter were 68% Range Rover, Range Rover Sport and Defender. That's up from 64% uh, for the same quarter last year. Again, it shows um, the strengths of those products and will allow us to continue to raise um, our average transaction price as we, uh, as we move forward. Got it, thank you. Uh, Ramnan, this is coming your way on CD margins, a strong performance in Q1. Are there any one-offs? If not, then ideally margin should improve further with increase in volumes in the subsequent quarters due to seasonality, steady pricing and commodity prices. Is that a fair assumption to make? Yeah, I think it's a fair assumption to make and in the Q1 results, there's no uh, specific one-offs. <laughs> Got it. So uh, let me add to this. So there is certainly no one-off in the first quarter results. I think we have been running a, a robust margin improvement program, focusing on both realizations as well as uh, the cost part. On the realization front, I think as I've spoken, it's all about uh, improving the competitiveness of the products, value selling, and therefore improving the value proposition for the customer, and therefore moving the focus from discounting to value. And on the cost front, I think we are looking at each and every cost element, including material cost, and we're driving that down and all this put together, therefore, has helped us. Now, looking forward, yes, I think traditionally Q1 onwards, the volumes keep on increasing. And we will also look forward to the same that is that should happen. But once that happens, I think, yes, it should help us. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Um, I think the next one, from Nishit Jalan on Nexon sales. Uh, PV volumes for Nexon have come down significantly in the last few months. Is this more because of new launches in the compact SUV segment or some shift in demand towards subcompact SUV punch? Shalish? You know, this was uh, only for a month or so, if I remember, that was in May, but in June again it bounced back. And uh, this month the sales have been very strong for Nexon. Uh, while the numbers would not have got published, but uh, from a retail perspective, this crossed 15,000 this month. So Nexon is doing really strong and Punch is equally doing strong. So customers for Punch and Nexon are completely different. Uh, both the volumes in both these products are sustaining uh, for a long period of time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Richard, next one coming your way. You answer the second part is from Kapil saying, uh, firstly, congratulates us on the Jaguar racing. What an achievement. I agree with you, Kapil. Couldn't agree more. Uh, question on China and EU. EU. What are the demand conditions, particularly in these two geographies? Uh, is demand at its bottom or dropping further in your segments? And do you see a need to raise incentives here? And aluminum supply you've already covered. 
Yeah, look, I, I, um, I think I've probably covered the China and certainly the China demand conditions. We do see it as, as muted um, and uh, we've performed fairly well through Q1. We're going to keep a very close eye on it through Q2 and Q3. Um, EU, uh, our performance, as I've mentioned, is, is pretty flat in terms of retail uh, in, in the EU. Uh, we do see it as a market where there uh, is a, a, a slight trend upwards in terms of the level of DME that's going to be required as uh, some of the European manuf manufacturers refocus their uh, sales efforts to that market. So yes, those are probably the two toughest regions for us going forward. On the flip side, the US remains extremely strong, uh, as does overseas and the UK is recovering uh, very well from a, uh, a difficult situation a few months ago. So th the world is not moving um, at one speed in the same direction in terms of demand. Yeah, and just staying with you for a minute, Richard, on the order backlog from Pramod UBS. Uh, can you can you just comment on yes. your order backlog at JLA and split All between yeah, all the backlog at the end of the quarter was 104,000 units, so uh, still in line with uh, where we would uh, where we would be expecting it to be. I think on a second is from Ashish Macquarie. Uh, does JLA run the risk of a YOY flattish volume given the supply disruption? I think the larger point is is making is are we just dependent on one vendor? And given this will hurt other players also, is it really possible to resolve the issue? Sorry, I've lost the question. Where is it? Uh, this is on your aluminium supplies, uh, Ashish Macquarie. Oh, there we are. OK, oh, it's down the bottom. Can you stop the screen? Thank you. Um, this is, yeah, this is this is one vendor um, that has had a flood at a major aluminium processing plant. Um, I think you'll have spotted in the press. Uh, it, we may not be the only uh, recipient of this uh, of this issue. Uh, we are normally very good at finding solutions um, to these types of issues, uh, and we are working on them aggressively, uh, both with Novellis uh, and with all of our other aluminium suppliers uh, and within the Tata ecosystem. Uh, so we think we have a, a decent chance of being able to minimise the impact on us. Got it, Richard. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Raghunandan Nuvama. We have answered most of his questions, barring the one at the end. Uh, Girish is coming your way. Mm. On India CV, uh, do you expect any favorable support for CVs and FAME 3? So, yes, Raghunandan. I think FAME 2 was meant for buses and small commercial vehicles. That's where we have seen the demand beginning in electric commercial vehicles. We expect similar support to be extended to trucks also, and that will help seeding uh, the electric trucks in some of the use cases. Some of the customers are anyway coming forward for that. We also expect some support or similar support to be given even to hydrogen as a fuel because that's also near zero emission fuel. And that kind of a support will also help because especially for long distance trucking, hydrogen may be better suited for it. So we are looking forward to this. Thank you. The other one is an interesting question from Sonal HSBC Mutual Fund. Why Tata Motors only got 4.7% of the merged Tata capital while by assets were almost 20%? Are there any legs to this transaction? I think Look at the two different books that are there, Tata Capital books and the Tata Motors Finance books. Uh, you'll find very different return profiles which are there in each of these books. And second is the level of concentration that is there. It's not a diversified book in Tata Motors Finance. The third thing we should look at for us to diversify that book before we take it to IPO, Tata Motors will have to start infusing capital into that. Then comes the whole regulatory framework that is there, which also needs to be managed. So from a Tata Motors Finance perspective, but at a motors perspective, I think it's a it's a peach of a deal in terms of going into a merge. I mean, a fully diversified entity and adding with our assets going in there with almost no overlap. It increases the diversity uh, diversification of that asset book, and that is going to IPO next year. 
which should then give us an ability to actually monetize this. And we are confident that we will recoup our investments in Tata Motors Finance uh, comfortably. So it's, it's a clean deal. And uh, obviously the valuers have looked at it uh, comprehensively. The board has looked at it comprehensively. And uh, we quite like the way it is currently being structured. I think we are nearing the end of the question queue. Let me uh, quickly take a look at anything that's missing here. Uh, one is on the JLR plant at Ranipet. We have not commented on that plant at all. Uh, and uh, at an appropriate time when we are ready, we will definitely talk about it. Uh, just one minute, please. This is from Nishit uh, Richard coming your way. The JLR. Sixty million revaluation impact that the company has highlighted was it only for the Jaguar models or includes LR as well? This, this is the commodity reval, right? That he's referring to. I think, I think so. the reval that that's referring to is stock revaluation in terms of variable marketing expense. Oh, okay, cool. I think with that we are more or less done with the questions. Uh, are we missing anything out there? Just a minute, guys. We'll just ensure there's nothing not covered. DNA also is done. So I think we, we, are, we are done with this. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your probing questions uh, and uh, look forward to catching up with you in the coming quarters as well. Thank you. And of course, thanks team. JLR, Terramoto is here. Uh, have a lovely evening. Bye bye.